Hey, hello and uh, welcome to the African Scholars Initiative AAS ASI Canada Graduate Study Webinar number six. Uh, this is the second in our series on study permits. My name is Professor Gideon Christian. I'm an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law, University of Calgary, and also the president of uh, African Scholars Initiative ASI Canada. Today, we are privileged to have with us an experienced immigration lawyer and a friend of ASI Canada in the person of Edos Omoro Tiawon, who I'm going to simply refer to as Edos. Edos is a Canadian born, sorry, it's a Nigerian born Canadian immigration lawyer practicing at the EO Law Office in Calgary, Alberta, here in Canada. Edos obtained his Bachelor's of Laws degree from the Faculty of Law, University of Benin, and Master's of Law degree from the Lagos State University, both in Nigeria. He was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1996 and the Alberta Bar in Canada in 2013. His expertise in Canadian he I mean, uh, specializes in Canadian immigration law, where he assists clients in permanent and temporary resident visa applications, such as study permits, post-graduation work permit, and um, work permit also. Edos also represent clients in challenging immigration visa refusal decisions before Federal Court of Canada. And one of his landmark case that changed the Canadian immigration law was the 2018 decision in Dingba and Canada Citizenship and Immigration Canada, where the Canadian visa office in Ghana refused his client's permanent resident visa application on the ground that the client submitted fraudulent document in her application. In setting aside that decision, uh, the decision of the visa officer, the federal court ruled in that case that a person accused of fraud or impropriety by a visa officer should be allowed to introduce extrinsic or additional evidence in court to rebuke the allegation of fraud made against them. That was a landmark decision because prior to this decision, that was not allowed. Edos is indeed an experienced immigration lawyer and a friend of ASI Canada, and we are very pleased to have him here today. So the format of this, this I mean, uh, webinar, or the webinar is going to take the form of a short presentation by Edos. Uh, after the presentation by Edos, we're going to open the floor for questions. We'll first start with the questions on the chat box. So please, if you have any question, type them on the chat box at the end of Edos' presentation. We will take the questions on the chat box. And uh, after taking the questions on the chat box, uh, Paul, we are then going to throw the floor open, depending on how much time we have for oral or audio, I mean, oral questions by the participants. So once again, uh, for all of you joining us uh, from different parts of the world, thank you very much for taking time to join us. I'm now going to turn the table over to Edel. Before we do that, please, could you take the time to mute the audio to minimize background noise? Thank you, and um, Edos, over to you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Edos Omorachon. I want to thank Professor Gideon Christian and ASI Canada for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic this morning. Um, again, I know we are all calling, we are all joining this meeting from different parts of the world, so you may be surprised I'm saying morning. It's morning here in Calgary, Alberta. I know it's afternoon where Professor Gideon Christian is, but again, you're all welcome. For the record, um, may I just clarify that I was called to the Nigerian bar in 1998 and to the Alberta bar in 2016. <laughs> I'm sure, Prof. So I just needed to clarify that for the purpose of our record, right? Um, I would want this. Um, webinar to be more like an interactive session. Uh, the essence is to give everyone the opportunity to contribute as much as they can, um, ask as many questions as they can. I will be sharing a slide with you just to help us move as fast as possible. 
I intend to conclude within the next 25 minutes and then give us the opportunity to ask as many questions as you want to ask. So um, let me just share my slide with you guys. Uh, Prof, can you activate um, screen sharing? Okay, I should give you some hosting rights. Give me a second. Um, make the calls. Can you try that now? See if it works. Yeah, I think it's good. Uh, I said, um, I'm working, welcoming all of you to this webinar. Um, it's going to focus on Canadian study permit. And um, as much as possible, we want to be as interactive as, um, as possible just to get everybody involved with this discussion. First and foremost, uh, from our experience, we have observed that there are certain categories of individuals who are always interested in study permits. Um, the very first set of individuals are people who are genuinely interested in studying, in, in embarking on studies in Canada. There are a couple of people who are genuinely interested, they don't look at any other options. Their options, be, their options from the get go is always to apply for study permits. There are also some categories of individuals who, um, who would want to use. Um, the study route as an option to permanent residence. Um, a lot of them look at the requirements under the Express Entry Policy and they find that they find the requirements to be very cumbersome. So they would all, always opt for the study permit option, thinking that that is a better route for them to follow. Um, but what I want to tell you is that as far as um, Canada is concerned, Studying in Canada is one of the fastest way of gaining permanent residence in Canada. The Canadian immigration system has, to a very large extent, carved out a pathway for international students to apply for, um, um, for, permanent, for permanent residence in Canada. Again, if you are used to the express entry policy, which is um, um, the, the policy introduced by the federal government of Canada to admit permanent residence into Canada, you'll find out that a special class has been created for international students who successfully complete their studies in Canada. And you would always hear of the class called the Canadian Experience Class. If you notice in the last 12 months, even more than 12 months since the pandem pandemic started, at the federal level, most of the ITAs, that's invitations to apply for permanent residence that are being issued, are being issued to, um, applicants within the Canadian experience class. What this means is that they are placing a lot of priorities to, I mean, on students who have studied here, completed their studies here in Canada, and are able to, um, able to um, make the application. Um, so as far as it relates to studies in Canada, if you are successfully making that, uh, making that application and you proceed to, uh, I mean, you proceed to, obtaining a study permit to study in Canada, that is a clear option for you to come into, um, um, that is a clear option for you to become a permanent resident of Canada. Just hold on, I think it is. Um... So in applying for study permit, there are things that every applicant must do. They will always counsel that you need a lot of patience, you need a lot of planning, you need a lot of documentation. If you are used to the Canadian immigration system, you would observe that all immigration applications, without exception, are document-based. By document-based, I mean the Canadian, uh, the, the, the IRCC would usually rely on the documents that you submitted in determining whether to grant your application or not. So putting together a watertight study visa application requires a lot of patience, it requires a lot of planning. It could take months, it could take years, but I would always advise you to have that patience, don't be in a hurry, plan properly, make sure that your documents are well in place for that application to be accepted. You have a very high chance of your application proceeding if your document, I mean, your documentation is appropriate. Now, a lot of people also have the misconception that the moment you gain an admission to study in Canada, 
you are good at being uh, at being admitted into Canada. Again, that is a misconception. Getting an admission to study in an academic institution in Canada is just the, the very first stage. You would need to apply for a study permit. For um, um, and again, I would consider the uh, the process of applying for a Canadian study permit as the most important step in that process. Because if you have an admission and you don't have a study permit to come into Canada, then it's meaningless. It is meaningless if you if you are if you are if you are if you are going about saying I have an admission to come into Canada and I am entitled to come into Canada. Prior to the pandemic, if you have an admission to study for a period less than six months, you do not require a study permit. But some modifications have been made, uh, I mean, have been made as a result of the pandemic. With the pandemic, um, even if you have an admission to study for a period less than six months, you are still required to apply for a study permit. So if you come on the basis of any other visa to come study for less than six months and you declare the border that you are coming to study, even if it's, even if it's for less than six months, they won't allow you in except you have a study permit. And the categories of persons who are required to apply for study permits are people other than Canadian citizens and permanent residents. Again, as a, Can as a Canadian permanent resident or citizen, you are, not, you are not required to apply for um, for study permit. From our practice, from our experience, we realize that there are a number of reasons why study permit applications are, are refused. Again, I'm going to um, I'm going to be discussing some of these reasons here, but please note that these reasons are not exhaustive. They are not exhaustive because um, there are a lot of discretion that um, are applied by visa officers when they are assessing um, study permit applications. Um, so you would see a visa officer give a reason that is even outside of these reasons that I'm stating here, but most of the reasons that are given for um, refusing study permit applications to be discussed this morning. The very first is purpose of travel. You also have reasons like personal assets and financial status, travel history, you also have refusals based on family ties to Canada and country of residence. You also have reasons such as uh, an application being too vague and poorly documented. You have reasons where a visa officer will say that they do not believe that you substantiated your level of establishment in your country of origin. Um, the, a visa officer would usually come up to say that they do not believe that there is um, a reasonableness of the expense that you are, you are, you are incurring in, in embarking on studies to Canada. Um, we have seen refusals where um, the visa officers have given, um, have provided their reason to say that uh, the applicants have limited employment prospects. And at times applications are refused if there are local substitutes in your, in your country of origin. I'll go ahead to discuss these reasons, um, one after the other. The very first is purpose of travel. Again, um, applications are refused under this grant based on the perception of the visa officer, the aura of your application. If a visa officer looks at your application in total and he has a general feeling that you have ulterior motives other than coming to Canada to study. They will refuse that application on the basis of the fact that they do not believe that your purpose of travel is as stated in the visa application, which is, um, which is to study. So this is more like a very subjective requirement, a subjective ground for refusing a visa, visa application. But I, uh, but I can tell you that this happens very often. The second is personal assets and financial status. Um, refusals under this head will usually occur when you've not provided, when an applicant has not provided adequate proof of um, um, the studies that, I mean, that the upper adequate proof of um, the, the financials they are relying on for their, for their study. If the, an applicant comes up with 
an application where you are not providing enough details of yourself or your sponsors um, in terms of financial details. You are not providing supporting documents to show what this person does. That may be a grant for the refusal of the application. Again, if you, you get with study, uh, study permit applications, you find out, especially for categories of students who are, um, who are underage, right? By underage, I mean 18 and lower, 18 years and lower. You find out that you find out that such applications are always sponsored by relatives. If you are providing the financial information of a, a relative whose relationship is too remote. All right, um, that may be a grant for that application to be refused. Um, a lot of people who don't have um, support for an application of this nature would go out there to look for somebody to sponsor them and come back to say, hey, uh, this is a maternal uncle, this is a paternal uncle, and all that. You will need to clearly establish your relationship with that sponsor for that application to proceed. And that's what we're saying here. If a visa officer feels that the relationship between the applicant and the sponsor is too remote, that may be a grant for the refusal of the application. In terms of travel history, um, you get to see a lot of applications that are refused on basis of the fact that the applicant has no travel history. Um, first and foremost, I personally believe that this is complete BS <laughs> because um, travel history is gained from a particular point, right? So if your application is um, well packaged, you should be able to explain um, um, explain your travel history, even if um, you're, you're, you explain this, this grant, even if you don't have any form of travel history. But please look, We've seen from our experience that a lot of students go to Ghana, that's to Accra, to South Africa, to Dubai, just for the purpose of fulfilling this requirement. Um, from our experience, we do not see that as um, some form of travel history. Uh, we, we see um, the visa officers relying on travel history to travel to the US, to North America, to Europe, UK, and most part of Western Europe, even Eastern Europe, some part of Eastern Europe has, has uh, adequate travel history. Uh, but like I said, if you do not have travel history, you should be able to obtain a study permit if your application is well packaged. Um, in terms of family ties to Canada and country of residence, this um, is a double-edged sword. The double-edged sword in the sense that a lot of people feel that um, having a relative in Canada is an added um, advantage to any application for study permit. It could be, but the reverse can also be the case. Um, for instance, if you have relatives in Canada, you don't have any in Nigeria, and you're making the application for study permit, trust me, the fact that you have ties to Canada would act as a disadvantage to, the, I mean, to your application for study permit. So you have to be able to look at this grant and be able to explain the type of ties you have to Nigeria and, uh, or, or the respective country where you are applying from and Canada. Um, in most of these instances, it is better that you have your letter of explanation will come down later. Letter of explanation, itemize some of these requirements for your application for study permit, and then you discuss them one after the other. You explain to the visa officer one after the other as to how you meet each requirement. In terms for study permits as well, a lot of applicants make the mistake of um, the primary applicant will usually apply for study permit alongside the family members. Again, that is a mistake because if you are applying with your family members for study permit, you are to a very large extent um, reducing your chances of obtaining a study permit in the sense that a visa officer may likely say, hey, you do not have ties to your native country because your family members, your wife or your husband and the children are coming with you 
and you are reducing your chances of obtaining study permits in that instance. So what we usually would advise is let the primary applicant make the application for study permit, and then you can um, over time apply for your other family members to join you uh, um, when after your, your study permit application has been granted. Another reason for the refusal of uh, study permit application is um, on the ground that uh, such applications are big or poorly documented. I think directly or indirectly, I have discussed this um, in one of the other subheads, but it is important that you have an application that is, that is thoroughly packaged. That application has to be um, descriptive enough. You have to have um, a letter of explanation, which to a very large extent speaks for you because it's, it's, an, it's a type of application that is paper based. The visa officer is looking at um, the documents that you presented to him or her in, in making a decision as to whether to grant the application. So you must have your letter of explanation right on top of your application, stating, um, I mean, um, uh, breaking down the requirements of the rules of the immigration rules as far as it relates to um, a study permit application. And then you will address each of these criteria um, uh, exhaustively so as to give the visa officer a perspective that this application has been properly packaged, that you know what the requirements of the rules are, and then you've gone ahead to submit documents in support of, of, of those requirements. Another reason, like I said earlier, for the refusal of study permit application is level of establishment. Now, an applicant who is sufficiently um, established financially, economically, and socially will stand a higher chance than the, uh, I mean, you know, the application being, being approved. If you are unemployed, if you are underemployed, there is a high chance that your application will be refused. If you have access to your country, whether um, assets in terms of stock, assets in terms of um, properties, you have a higher chance of your application being, uh, uh, being approved. So what we usually would recommend, even where your sponsor had a lot of properties wherever you are applying from, we usually would recommend that you get them to um, obtain an evaluation. Evaluations are not expensive, right? Put the assets together, whether in terms of stock, whether in terms of physical properties, put them together, get a firm. There are a lot of firms out there who can provide you an evaluation based on the documents you sent to them, which you can submit alongside um, the application that you are sending out uh, to, to IRCC for, for study permit. Another reason for the refusal of study permit application is reasonableness, reasonableness of expense, given the high cost of study in Canada. Again, um, even though Canada is one of the worst sought after destinations for study, for study all over the world, it is an expensive venture to come into Canada to study. So these officers would generally look out for um, the reasonableness of your expense. Again, this is a very subjective um, 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 test that is applied by visa officers. If they look at the oral, they look at your application, they look at how the application is presented, and they feel, I'm saying feel here because it's very subjective, they feel that the expense you intend to embark upon to study in Canada is unreasonable, then they may refuse your application. The, which is why it's also very important that you have your application, you ensure that your application is well packaged. If your application is well packaged, you have the, the proper documents in place in respect of each of the criteria for uh, granting an application for study permit, the chances that a, a visa officer would say that your, uh, your application is not reasonable, I mean, the expense you intend to embark is not reasonable, will be very, very uh, limited. If you have very limited employment prospects, a visa officer would generally refuse your application for study permit, even if you meet all other requirements. Right, so um, if you do not show, again, that is where your letter of explanation matters. 
That is where if you had an employer before leaving, before making the application for study permit and the employer is aware that you're making an application for study permit, we usually would cancel that, look, hey, first and foremost, show in your letter of explanation why you have very good employment prospects after you complete your proposed study. It could be in the form of a letter from your employer saying they are aware that you are coming into Canada to study. This is the role you have performed in, uh, you have performed prior to the application. This is what you are coming to do after you complete your study. So it is important that your application is packaged in such a way that you are able to explain um, the progression. The progression in the sense that you have acquired some studies in the country you are applying from. You have, you have had some form of employment prior to the application you are making. You are coming to Canada to study a particular course and you will put your post-study plan in place. Even though we know most students would apply for permanent residence at the point at which you are making the application for study permit, you must also make room for your post-study plan which would, which would necessarily involve you returning back to your country of um, your country of origin or wherever you are applying from. So have a post-study plan that would generally explain what you intend to do after you, after you complete your study. One of those cases could be, hey, I intend to return back to my employer. I intend to take up this employment. Refer them to your employer's letter saying X, Y, Z, as far as it relates to your post-study uh, I mean post um, uh, plan. And I think that will suffice for, for this purpose. Now, um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why applications for study permits are, are, are refused is when there are local substitutes available. Um, if you are making an application for study permit, you must also first and foremost check how many schools in your country of um, origin or wherever you are applying from offer the same type of course. So the less prevalent a course of study is in uh, the country where you are applying from, the higher the likelihood that your application for study permit will be granted. So um, you have general courses like accounting, business, HR, um, which are offered by, by schools all over the world, right? For those of you who are applying from, I mean, who are joining this webinar from Nigeria, you know that there are a lot of schools within Nigeria who offer um, courses in accounting, whether graduate courses, postgraduate courses, whatever, whatever level in accounting, in business administration, in HR. So what we usually would what we usually would advise is that when you are making, uh, when you are seeking admission for such courses, such general courses in quotes try as much as possible to narrow your options in the, sense of, in the sense that you are looking at specialized areas within those courses. So if you, are, if you take accounting, for instance, you are talking about forensic fraud, or you are taking business admin, for instance, you are saying business information system, business entrepreneurship and innovation. innovation. But the bottom line is try as much as possible not to just take a general course that is, uh, that is available all over, that is available from the country you're applying from, try as much as possible to look at a specialized area within that general field that will stand you out and that would increase your chances of, uh, increase the chances of the visa officer saying, hey, yes, I've looked at this course, I've checked other schools within the country where this applicant is applying from. This course is not available. I've looked at these persons, I've looked at this applicant's um, 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 current employment, um, he or she does something similar to it, or he or she intends to um, um, to move to this area of um, a practice. And I believe that um, coming into Canada to study this particular course is, is necessary for for this uh, for this applicant to progress in life, right? So you must ensure that you try as much as possible to reduce the opportunity of a visa officer. Um, reaching the conclusion that there are local substitutes are, are available in the country that you are applying from. Do not forget that, again, we said, if it is a discretionary application, you must ensure that you are 
um, addressing all the concerns that may be raised by the visa officer so as to get your application um, um, approved. So in concluding this um, talk this morning, I would say again that the reason for the refusal to study permit application is non-exhaustive. There are so many other reasons that I haven't mentioned here, but most of the reasons that are given by visa officers for refusing study permit application have been discussed here this morning. Um, every study permit application is treated by um, um, the review visa officer as a permanent residence application in these guys. What this means is that they know that more often than not, if you, are, if you succeed in coming to Canada to study, you would apply for permanent residence. So they know that a lot of people use it as a backdoor means of coming to Canada as permanent residence. So there is a greater scrutiny by these visa officers to ensure that the people they are aligned to come in here to study are the right set of people, knowing that ultimately it will impact on the population of Canada. As of this moment, uh, we believe that at least 95% of applicants who succeed in coming into Canada to study, um, apply for permanent residence. You hardly would see anybody coming in here to apply for, I mean, to, to study without applying for permanent residence. The worst case scenario, they keep it as an option. They apply for permanent residence, have their permanent residence, leave the country or return back um, after a period of time. But they usually would apply for their postgraduate work permit after studies and, uh, and then within that period that you have a valid postgraduate work permit, you apply for your permanent residence. Again, visa officers refusing study permit applications have a high discretionary, uh, discretionary power, um, and they can decide to refuse the application even if you meet all the requirements. Again, uh, we see this from time to time. Um, there is a high level of discretion exercised by visa officers, so you should try as much as possible to ensure that you um, you you package your application in a manner that addresses all the criteria for the grant of a study permit application. So, if I if I may walk you back a little bit, where you should start from should be what are the requirements for a study a study permit application of this nature. Look at all those requirements and ensure that your your documentation is tailored to meet each of those requirements in such a manner that a visa officer will look at it and say yes this applicant has been able to uh, convince me that this application should be granted. Again, um, even when your study permit application is refused, uh, I know a lot of people out there believe that you have no right to appeal. Yes, there is no appeal process, but you can apply for leave and for judicial review of the refusal that has been handed over to you. What this entails is that you can get a lawyer here in Canada, an immigration lawyer here in Canada, to file an application at the Federal Court of Canada, challenging the, challenging the refusal um, handed over to you by the visa officer. So directly or indirectly, it is an appeal process, right? So um, what I can tell you from our own experience is that there are multiple reasons why you should consider applying for leave and judicial review of a refusal that has been handed over to you by an immigration officer. And we say this not only because um, we feel it is the right thing to do if your application is if your application is well packaged and has been refused, but because if you have an intention to make a subsequent application, it is always better to have an application for leave and judicial review. The only reason, I mean, one of the reasons being that any visa officer who uh, who will look at your subsequent application, we know that this person knows his right, his or her right, and would ensure that the application is adequately assessed uh, in reaching his or her decision. From EOLO's perspective, it is the appropriate thing to do. Do it if you, if you, if you know that you've, um, you've um, permitted an application that was well documented. Um, also do it because it will help any future application that you're making. At EO law, we have a success rate in handling applications for leave and judicial review. At the last count, I think our success rate is above 90%. So which means um, out of every 10 applications for our leave and judicial review that we make, nine succeed and only one fail. So I would encourage you, it's a process that you need to continue, I mean, you need to follow up with if 
your application for study permit has been well packaged. So that's about it. Thank you very much for giving me the time, Prof. And um, I'll welcome all the questions. Thank you. Okay, Edos, thank you so much. Just give me a minute. Let me quickly do some tech work here. Um, so Edos, uh, thank you so much for your time and for your uh, for your presentation. Uh, you see, there is something I want the participants to take from this webinar, and that is the importance of the study permit application process. Uh, currently, about 80% of study permit applications in Canadian visa offices in Africa are refused by Citizenship and Application Canada. That means, in essence, every 10 applications, about eight are refused. The essence of this webinar is not to guarantee you the success of your subsequent uh, study permit application. The essence is to put you in such a position that you will have the highest chance of success should you decide to apply. And um, applying for to study in Canada, I've always said was probably one of the best decision I think I made. And the reason is because uh, the Canadian immigration system kind of makes it in such a way that um, if you come into Canada to study, you have a sure guaranteed part to permanent residency. So Canada is not like those other countries that when you finish, you are given work permit for, for some few years, and then after that, you are required to leave. Canada seeks to attract students, retain them, for them to become permanent residents and Canadian citizens. But that process is a difficult process. The most important part of that process is being able to scale that hurdle of getting in, getting a study permit. So that's why when you're sending in your application, it's very important to make sure your application is well packaged. And that is the essence of this webinar to provide you with information that will ensure that your application is well packaged. If you're using it as a part for permanent residency, that's completely a decision for you to make. But um, even if at the end of the study, you choose to live on your own, like Edos rightly said, you lose nothing by getting that permanent residency. Depart Canada if you don't want to stay. And someday when you change your mind and you want to come back, you always have that part to come back. So um, before I throw the floor open for question, there is uh, something I'll probably want to raise from your presentation, and that is the issue of travel history. Um, I think there was a question there. So maybe I will probably bring Mariam in now. Let's take the question, then maybe in the process of taking the question, I'll probably bring in additional points I want to raise from your presentation. So uh, Mariam, um, if you have, if you are ready and you have some of the questions from the audience, can you please yes. go ahead um, and... Hi, Prof, thank you so much. So I'm just, uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to dive into the, the questions. Uh, and to people in the audience, if you have any further questions, feel, please feel free to uh, drop them in the, in the chat box and, and we'll take it from there. Okay, so the first question here is, is a question from jo Joseph. And Joseph goes, um, how does an applicant without travel history tackle uh, this obstacle when he or she hasn't traveled outside his or her home country before. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Um, again, I told you that, that that's one of the subjective, um, that's one of the discretionary powers that are visually exercised by visa officers. Um, we have had instances where visa applications were refused based on the fact that they don't have travel history. And I can assure you that we've challenged some of those decisions successfully. Um, um, so travel histories are definitely obtained from somewhere. It starts from a particular point. And if your first application to travel out of Nigeria is an application to study in Canada, that should not be a reason for the refusal of your study permit application. Generally, we understand why 
that role is implied in the study permit application. And you would generally expect someone who has traveled out of Nigeria and returned to Nigeria to also travel to Canada to study and uh, return back to Nigeria at the end of it. So as, I mean, wherever you are applying from, from at the end of it, so as study. Uh, pardon me if I'm always referring to Nigeria. I can see that most of the most of the people who are joining this webinar are from Nigeria of origin. Should not negatively impact your application. At the point where you are making your application, ensure that in your explanation letter you identify that criteria. You state exactly why you haven't traveled out of. You haven't seen a need. You haven't. Uh, you, you 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 haven't seen a need to travel out of the country where you are applying from, and um, if you explain that properly, I think that should be an exception in this case for the visa officer to say yes. And there are a lot of people whose, whose applications are, are, are granted um, who do not have prior travel history. So again, it depends on how the application is, 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 um, is packaged. If you look at most refusers, there is less than a 10% chance that your application will be refused only on the ground that you don't have travel history. Yes, some these officers may be excessive to, to state that. But you find out that this grant of refusal would usually accompany other grants if they feel that if they feel that you do not meet the requirements of other grants, they will leave them, they will leave them out and add the fact that you don't have prior, prior travel history for the completeness of the refusal that they are providing to you. Um, okay, thanks, Eidos. Uh, thanks for bringing those points. And um, I mean, in addition to that, I also want to add that, I mean, there has been a series of case laws in Canada that had made it very clear that a visa officer cannot make negative inference from the fact that an applicant does not have a travel history. Because doing that would be a sort of vicious cycle whereby the applicant cannot travel because they don't have a travel history and I cannot get a travel history because they are not given a visa to travel. So that's such a, a vicious cycle. And so the position of the law there is very clear. A visa officer cannot refuse study permit application on that ground alone. So sometimes a visa officer that is stubbornly bent on refusing your application will only look for reason and they kind of try to bring in travel history as an addition to other reasons they have. And I believe one way you can address this, of course, in the course of your application, um, in the course of your application, it's very important to maybe probably have in your statement of purpose, or maybe, sorry, in your, I mean, maybe a letter accompanying your application. Letter of explanation, yeah. Yeah, letter of explanation. Have a particular provision there addressing why you don't have a travel history, you know, and the fact that, you know, granting you this application will give you opportunity to acquire that travel history. So in this way, by doing this, you're kind of narrowing down that visa officer's opportunity or discretion to capitalize on travel history to reach a negative decision. So try to kind of preempt that from happening by addressing your lack of travel history and why a negative inference should not be made from, your, uh, from, from that lack of uh, a travel history. If I may just chip in here briefly, if you look at all the grants that we've discussed here this morning, if you are looking at making an application for study permit, you ensure that these grants are itemized in your letter of explanation. Make sure that your, doc your documentations are tailored to meet these requirements and explain them. Explain those documentation, explain all that in your letter of explanation in support of the visa application. You would have attained a very large um, level of um, um, success with, with respect to the study permit application you are submitting. Okay, so thank you. If there are no further comments, I'll just move on to the next question. Um, next question is from Ulua Femi. Um, he goes, thank you so much for this information. I am 36 years old and intending to start a postgraduate diploma in August. I am single and also an entrepreneur here in Nigeria. How do I strengthen my home? Because my siblings are abroad. How do I strengthen home ties clause? Secondly, I administrate over my late parents' properties through the, though the official documents are not yet out. Can I still state this in my SOP? Thank you. Um, 
Beside the question you've asked, there are so many dimensions to your application. I don't think this is the right for to discuss uh, to discuss all that. But the fact that you are 36 years old, the fact that you are single, the fact that um, you are looking to to come here to um, to to study a postgraduate diploma may act as um, I'm looking for the right word, maybe disadvantageous to your application sort of, because you need to be able to explain the progression of your studies. Um, in making that application, I would always advise that look at your age, look at your marriage status. The fact that you are single reduces your chances in terms of family ties. But if you have family assets in Nigeria, even if it's not directly related, related to you, if those assets are um, uh, for the estate of your late parents, I don't know whether you are the only um, administrator of that estate or executor of that estate. So you may not have the right to be able to provide some form of sponsorship letter to, um, uh, to support your application. So you may look for another way of trying to address the issue of sponsorship if you are um, a self-employed uh, businessman in your home country, tell me what I would recommend is ensure that your, uh, the documents relating to your business, if you have financial statement for the business, for the, for the, for the number of years that you've had the business, um, you need to be able to provide that in support of the application. You also need to be able to explain what would, what would happen in terms of the vacuum being created as uh, 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 when you when you eventually come into Canada to study, so I think that you have to be very careful. This is a very dicey application that you are looking to make. I think that you probably would need to maybe contact a professional who can look at your um, look at everything in total and make a decision as to uh, advise you as to how you should progress with, with this application. Okay. It froze, it froze at some point, right? Yes, but we have you back now. Okay, that's fine. So I, I guess you heard the last thing I said, right? I believe we, do, we did. Do you, like okay. do you like dictionaries? Okay, uh, so let's, um, um, before we proceed to the next question, there's also another very important point I'll probably raise here, uh, Edos, and um, which I want you to uh, maybe probably speak to the participants about. And that is the issue of travel ban, which uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada has been seriously, um, maybe probably, uh, uh, let me put it, the, let me look, think of the best way to put it. So, there's a provision in the, uh, um, in the Canadian immigration law whereby if an applicant makes a false statement in their application, whatever application, whether for study permit or permanent residency in Canada, they are liable to be banned or barred from entering into Canada for five years. And uh, recently there has been a surge in the application of that particular provision more than ever. And um, from personal observation, I noticed that in most cases, people that have fallen victim to this draconian or very rigid provision part of the immigration law are people who normally have visa refusal in some other countries, but refuse to declare it in their application when they're applying to migrate or study in Canada. So Edos, I would like to welcome, I mean, from your a practice experience, what will, what, do you, what will you have to say about um, the application of this part? I think that's section 40, I believe, of the um, Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. I don't know if you can comment on that. Uh, I mean, at least to serve as a warning to participants, because it's one thing for your visa application to be refused. If your visa application is refused at 12 a.m. this morning, you can file another application at 12.01. But where it comes to section 40 ban, you are barred from entering into Canada for five years. 
And even at the end of that five years, your chance of getting to Canada has practically, it's practically zero because you have a history of lacking credibility. So I probably want to kind of get your view on that. I mean, if you can comment on that and what advice, serious advice you offer to participants at this webinar with regards to that provision. Thank you, Prof. The, the very first thing I need you guys to understand is the fact that um, the authorities here now realize that Canada is a well sought after destination. Canada shares information. If I say information, immigration information with other countries. These other countries are the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. So these five countries share information. Again, I'll repeat these countries. They are Canada, the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. So if you've made any application to any of these countries, any of these five countries, and you're applying to study in Canada, your information with these other countries will be provided to the authorities in Canada. So the very first thing that you need to understand is you need to ask yourself, where else have I made applications to? Please note, the fact that your application has been refused in any of these other countries, US, United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand, does not necessarily mean that your Canadian study application will be refused. Again, we've seen cases where a study permit application is refused in Canada and an application is, is accepted in Australia, right? More often than not, they'll check, your, they'll check, they'll check based on the information you provided, they'll check with these other countries to find out whether you've made applications to them. The essence of checking with these other countries is to obtain as much information as they can, right? Once they obtain this information, they will find out whether they are, this information are, in, are consistent with the information you provided in support of your visa, I mean, your study visa application. If they are inconsistent, definitely you'll be refused based on the fact that you have provided information that, that, that is not, not only misleading the problem. And in that case, you'll be banned. We have seen cases where students who apply to Canada to study, we are refused in their subsequent application based on the fact that it said, uh, they answered in the negative to the question where you are asked whether you've ever been refused visa to any country. So if you've been refused visa to any country, your answer to that question will be yes. And once you answer yes, there is a box right under that form where you are required to explain where you've been refused visa and all that. What we have had to do, which is why it is important that you make your application for leave and for judicial review. I'll give you a case scenario, for instance. We had a student who applied for study visa about two months ago. That application was refused. Immediately, um, a new application was submitted on behalf of the student. In submitting the new application, this is a young student. In submitting the new application, um, again, this application was prepared by an immigration lawyer with the assistance of um, um, a legal assistant, right? In preparing the form, the legal assistant erroneously answered in the, ne in the, in the, in the negative uh, to the question where you are asked whether you've been refused previous uh, visas to any other country. But on the same day that the application was submitted, the lawyer noticed the error and sent a letter to um, IRC is saying, I noticed this error. The answer should have been yes. He was refused this visa and all that. He still went ahead to refuse that application based on the fact that he, has, he, has, he provided misleading information. Then we challenged that decision at the federal court. We just set it aside about um, a week ago, right? So if there are circumstances that made you to answer no when you are supposed to answer yes, we would recommend that you challenge that decision because eventually if you do not challenge it, you are banned, you'll be banned for five years. For applications that are filed from outside of Canada, you have 60 days from the date the refusal decision was handed over to you to challenge that decision. So if your application, for instance, was refused today, you have 60 days from today to challenge that decision on the federal court. 
there are a number of reasons why you may answer you may answer no instead of yes. If we look at those reasons, I would believe that those reasons are genuine enough. Yes, we'll make that application on your behalf. But if you deliberately intended to, um, to, um, to a very large extent not divulge such negative immigration history, then your application for leave and for judicial review at the federal courts may most likely fail. So look out for it, ensure that you ensure that you, you are answering the questions properly. Ensure that you, you know you are aware that you, you have made applications to other countries and those applications need to be um, stated in the application for study permit to Canada. In, in, the only reason why they should be stated is if, for instance, you travel to any of these other four countries, that's part of your travel history. It addresses the issues relating to travel history. If you've been refused applications, any application, whether for study permit or for visit or whatever, in any of these other four countries, state it because you are required to state it for the visa officer to have full information about you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Edos. I'm just trying to, give me a second. I'm trying to share um, a screen. Um, excuse me. Um, I don't know. Can you see my screen? Oh, sorry. I think I'm sharing yeah. the wrong screen. Okay, so this is the part of the form. Uh, this is the study permit application form. Now, if you look here, um, so this is the question, question number two here. Have you ever, okay, this is one of the question. Have you ever remained beyond the validity of your status, attended test school without authorization and work without yeah. authorization in Canada? Because the answer in yeah. this case, no, this is the, the question yeah. here would be, sorry, B, yeah, B, yeah, B. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been refused a visa or permit, denied entry or order to leave Canada or any other country, other country or, territory. or territory? It's not just limited to Canada, any other country. Now, there's always a tendency to answer no here. Yeah. This is just an, a very kind of uh, hidden but dangerous part of your application process. Mm -hmm. If you answer no here and proceed and you have been refused a visa to US, New Zealand, Australia, UK, or the others, this answer alone can come back and haunt you for five years. This is an automatic bar from entering into Canada. Before COVID, once you normally send in your application and they run your background, they do that within two weeks. They will send you what is known as a procedural fairness letter. Hey, we discovered that you had a previous visa application, but you did not disclose it in your application. We're giving you an opportunity to respond to it. In most cases, even after your response, they will buy you. And the process of having that bar set aside, that ban set aside is a very difficult process you don't want to go into. So please, if you have been refused any, I mean, visa application to any country, even outside these five countries, Nothing harms you from the, I mean, you don't suffer any loss from disclosing it. It doesn't have any impact on your application. They will not refuse your application because you applied for a visa to Malaysia and it was refused. That will not be a ground to refuse you your visa application. I mean, I have seen cases where the visa officer, I mean, the applicant was not even refused visa to these five countries that Edos mentioned. The applicant applied for visa to another country. And what they did was that they did probably some internet search with the name of the applicant. Then they noticed that the applicant was shortlisted for a particular conference in a country which that applicant did not attend. That applicant's visa was refused initially. After a judicial review, which turned, overturned the, uh, the initial application, on the second review, they decided to invite the applicant for an oral interview that was at the Canadian visa office in Ghana. It was at that process of that oral interview that they now brought this question, but we saw that you were shortlisted to attend this conference. Why did you not go? 
the applicant was a kind of shock where it was like, okay, well, yes, I was shortlisted, but I did not carry on with the process. I did not apply for visa. So what we are simply saying is this, there is an obligation on your part to be forthright and honest with your visa application process. You know, worst case scenario is a case where the applicant submit fraudulent document knowingly. That's a worst case scenario. But what I'm telling you is that that worst case scenario also goes with them with the same consequences as you having previously been refused a visa and you come to this box and tick no instead of yes. That it, that's, it's very serious. It may get you a five year ban from entering into Canada. So they say a word is enough for the wise. Please be honest in your application process. It's one thing for the visa officer to refuse your application. If they refuse your application, you can always go back, re-strategize and apply again. If you're banned for five years, for that five years, you cannot apply to enter Canada. And even after the, you've served your sentence of five years and you now try to apply, that history of five year ban is a heavy stigma on any other application you are sending to Citizenship and Immigration Canada. Thank you for okay, that. So that's, that's, that, that's very important. If I may just quickly check in here, I've had an instance where um, you have this individual who got his, who got a two year multiple, um, multiple visit visa to so the United States, applied to the German embassy for a visa. She was turned down at the German embassy because they believed that the information she provided was misleading. But of course, the German, inter the German interview was an oral interview, so she had to attend physically. And they had the opportunity of reviewing her passport to see that there was an American visa on that passport. They didn't say anything. And they left her to go, denied her application for visa to Germany. The very next day after she attended the interview at the German embassy, the American embassy called her to say, she was needed at the, at, the, at the American embassy for an interview and that she should come with the passport. She goes over to the American, uh, American embassy and right there and then they voided her visa to travel to the United States. So in that case, you will see that not only has her immigration history extended beyond these five countries that were mentioned, but it has extended to the Schengen territory because the fact that Germany now has a negative immigration about her, uh, about her also means that all the countries within the Schengen territory would have the same information. So we really need to be careful with what we're doing here. Okay, thanks, Edos. Uh, Mariam, can we have the next question? Okay, um, so the next question here is from Arsema's iPhone. Um, she, this person says, thank you so much. I am an undergrad student. Will I maybe qualify? I think that's a rather weak question. An undergrad student in Canada or outside of Canada or where? Um, well, can the person asking the question maybe clarify by typing in another question? Uh, or okay. maybe just to give other people room to give other people room to ask their question. If you are an undergrad student within Canada, yes, you are you are qualified to apply for postgraduate work permit as soon as you complete your studies in Canada. If you are outside of Canada, yes, you have the, um, you can apply for, for study permit, but considering the fact that you've already started um, uh, undergrad studies in, in wherever you are applying from, um, it will be a tall order for you to be able to get a study permit to come here to study. Would, I would usually recommend complete your studies, get your work experience, look at your permanent residence option, or a, a post-grad option to come study in, in Canada. I guess that's the general answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so moving, moving on quickly, the next question is from our boss, Eddie. Um, can you come with your family for study? I think that question might have been answered, but... Yes, I, I think I provided an answer to that question. We we'll recommend that the primary applicant apply first, um, uh, and then your family members can apply afterwards. The essence is for you to be able to prove that you have enough ties, you have strong ties to the country that you are applying from. If you give the impression that you are coming into Canada to study and you are coming with your entire family, 
um, that reduces your chances. That gives the visa officer room to say, you know what, hey, I believe this person is eloping with the entire family and they will suddenly not return back to Canada. But there are, there are other ways of going about it and achieving the same goal. Apply first, get your visa, get, get your study visa and move on. Again, don't forget that the fact that you are adding your family members, your family members increases, increases the financial threshold, right? If ordinarily you are meant to have ten thousand dollars to substantiate that you can you can um, you, you can study successfully in Canada, by adding your family members, it then means that you've increased that number to a higher number depending on the number of family members you are coming with. Thank you. So um, the next question here is from Murphy. Um, will the slides be shared afterwards? Um. So we will make the video recording from the presentation available on our YouTube channel. So normally at the end of the presentation, we send out emails using Eventbrite to all registered participants with the YouTube link to the video. Um, I, I'm not sure Eventbrite allows you to attach, um, I mean, email through Eventbrite allows you to attach uh, or to include an attachment. If it does, yes, we'll be including it. But if not, you should you should definitely be getting the link to the YouTube, I mean the YouTube link to the video recording at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Prof. Um, so moving on. Um, the next question here is from Ade. Um, and Ade goes, does having an express entry profile affect the study permit application? Won't it show dual intent and that the person is not intending to come back to the country of residence? To a very large extent, yes, which is why we, would, we usually would advise that you have a plan, have a plan to, to immigrate to Canada, right? Um, you have a higher chance if you don't have a prior application or you don't have an, another application out there. Don't forget the fact that you have, you, it's an express entry application is an application. The fact that you're already in the pool makes you very visible, which means the information you are furnishing in support of your application for study must be consistent with the profile that you set up uh, 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 um, in respect of your application for permanent residence. So I would generally advise that, hey, have a plan. If your plan is to apply for study permit, do not create an express entry profile first because to a very large extent, it reduces your chances of getting um, um, getting a successful uh, study permit application, right? So um, yes, it reduces your chances because it shows to a very large extent dual intent. You are applying to you are applying to come here as a permanent resident. You are applying to study to say, hey, I want to study and return back to my country. A visa officer who looks at this may, may just say, you know what? I don't believe you and deny it. That does not mean, however, that there are people that there are, there are not people out there who have um, express entry profile and have applied for study for studies in Canada and have uh, have had their applications granted. So you must again, if you must make an application for study permit after your um, after you create an express entry profile, you must in your letter of explanation. Um, um, to a very large extent, draw the visa officer's attention to this issue and explain thoroughly why you are making the application for study permit, hoping that that explanation will be, um, will be accepted by the visa officer reviewing your application. Uh, let me come in here, Eidos. Um, when it comes to this issue, I try to kind of be very realistic. Um, and the reason is because um, when it comes to study permit application from, Af from Africa, I think um, the process seems to be, what ground do we have to refuse this application? That what ground do we have to grant the application? And this is why you have over 80% refusal. So the fact that you have an express entry profile and now you're explaining to the visa officer, you know what, I'm just going there to study. Yeah, I have a an express entry profile, but I'm also going there to study. That will be very hard to sell. True. That will be very hard to sell. Make your, you are already disadvantaged because of the region you are applying from. Do not make things more difficult by yourself. I have seen cases of individuals who on review of their application, 
you can see that, well, this person has met and exceeded every requirement stated in the rule for the grant of study permit application, and they are still refused. They have to go to court in Canada, challenge the decision, have the decision set aside, send back to the visa office. The visa office will refuse it again. They now come back to federal courts in Canada for the second time, start that same process all over again. And this is a very expensive and time-consuming venture. So at the end of the day, of course, this individual end up having their visa, but at what cost, at what resources? So when applying for study permit application to Canada, your best bet is to make sure that you get it on first shot. If there is anything, even if it is an EE profile, express entry profile that will make that difficult, please, I mean, think of what to do. Even if it entails, you know, um, um, you know, putting aside the, creating an express entry profile for us and focus on this, then having those tools and then making your journey more complicated. And another thing I would also like to add, which is related to what I have stated before about, you know, the ban and the others, because um, immigration, citizenship and immigration Canada is really stepping up on ban now. Whatever information you are entering in your application, please make sure they conform with whatever information you have on your public profile on the internet. Your job experience you entering in your application, make sure it is the same with what you have in your LinkedIn profile. If you have something different in your LinkedIn profile and you have another thing different in your application, I bet you there will be a problem because these officers go out of their way to search for publicly available information about you. I have seen case of an individual who permanent resident application was refused because the job they have on their LinkedIn profile was not declared in their permanent resident application. I think I was refused for that same reason. And that's why we challenged it. Yeah. So of course there may be room, you can go to court and challenge it. You know, but I mean, in the case of this individual, unfortunately, he went to court and challenged it and it was not successful. There may be cases that might be successful, but what he just don't want to have is that stress of having, you know, a judge making the decision as opposed to the visa officer. The judge making the decision is time consuming because judicial review application now, you're probably looking at something minimal one year. Then you okay. think about the cost. So, um, yeah, so these are some important points you actually need to take into consideration. When you're filling those forms, do a Google search of yourself and find out what's out there you put knowingly or ignorantly about yourself. It might be probably some profile you created, you don't even know it still exists there. Do a Google search about yourself and see what information is there and make sure those information complies with whatever you are filling or whatever information you are submitting to the visa officer. And that's very true. We just attended a hearing where what, what, um, what uh, the minister did Minister for Citizenship and Immigration did was to go to this client's Facebook profile. They realized that the client had two Facebook profiles. They realized that the client had made an application to the United States for visa. They also pulled the two previous visitors of this application that the client made to Canada and then put all this information in the form of a disclosure to say, you know what? Based on all this information, we believe that what she's presently claiming is inconsistent with what she claimed previously, right? So you have to be careful as to your social media presence out there. You have to be careful as to the information you are putting out there. Like I said, Dingba, Dingba, Dingba was refused because they went to the company's website, they reached some conclusions, they, they, you may not believe it, even your phone number tied to your application, application for study permit will be identified, right? You know, there are certain apps that you can use to trace who actually owns the number. In this case, they trace the client's number and realize that that number belongs to the client's employer. And their conclusion was, no, you cannot be using your client, your employer's phone number. Yeah, even if a procedural letter was issued in that instance, the procedural letter that was sent did not address those concerns that they raised in refusing the application, which we challenged and we were successful with. 
But the bottom line here is try as much as possible to be aware of your social media presence, ensure that your social media presence, uh, um, um, the information that you have, you have put out there are consistent with the information that you are presenting to the visa officer in support of your application for study permit. But again, yes, in terms of applying for study permit when you have, um, when you have an express entry profile, that is a tall order. I will say that again. I've seen one or two cases where student, I mean, um, um, uh, such applicants succeed. It's a very difficult process, and you don't want to put yourself in that position, just like Prof has stated. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so moving on, the next question here is from Abayomi. Hi, can one come for a postdoc with a study permit and afterwards get a PR? I think that has been answered. Yeah, I think we've answered that question. If you come for a postgraduate, um, if you come for a postgraduate uh, program, um, again, it depends on the duration, right? Um, there, there is what you call a postgraduate work permit that is issued to every um, every student who successfully completes their study in Canada and meets the criteria, right? Depending on the duration of your program in Canada, if it is one year and below, you are given a postgraduate work permit for one year. If it is more than you are given a postgraduate work permit for uh, for three years, right? Within that period, you are expected to have um, you are expected to apply for permanent residence, either under the Canadian Experience Class, which means somebody who has studied here and has been able to acquire Canadian experience, Canadian work experience for a minimum of one year, or you are applying under the Federal Skilled Worker Class, which means somebody who is applying from the out of country and you have a minimum of one year work experience in the last 10 years, but there are options for you when you come in here to study, to, to have your postgraduate studies to, to, to become permanent resident. Okay, so the next question here is from um, Alemu too. And the question is, let's say I have secured a study permit and have, have come to Canada uh, and later I want to bring my wife and she got the visa until when is she supposed to come to Canada if she's given a four years visa? Um, okay, <laughs> let me take that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, that would depend. Well, um, anyway, I don't know uh, the current, I, are you talking about based on the current situation on ground, the COVID situation? That's a clarification I probably want. Are, are we talking about based on the current COVID situation or normal circumstances? So I, 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 I probably will just answer that question generally if she has any further any further responses to that then that's it yes yeah, so I'll pick it up okay so when you are issued a visa to Canada um, you can enter into Canada anytime within the validity of that visa so uh, if you issued a visa and your today is 10th of April if you issued a visa and your visa is expiring on 11th of April that means you can come into Canada until, I mean, you can come into Canada anytime till that 11th of April. So Canadian visa are not like other countries whereby you are required to leave the country by the time the visa expires. Once you enter Canada, you can enter Canada anytime before the visa expires. And once you enter, the visa officer has the discretion to determine how long you would stay. They will normally write that in your visa that you have until this date to leave. If there is no entry to that effect on your visa or your passport, rather, that means you have six months from the day you entered into Canada. So if your visa is expiring on 11th of April and you enter into Canada on 10th of April, and there is no annotation on your study, I mean, on your, uh, I mean, your visiting visa as to when you should leave, that means you have six months from the 10th of April you entered. So in response to that question, if your wife is issued a four-year visa, she can enter Canada anytime before the expiration of that four years. And that is a general answer to your question. But now there are COVID restrictions in place, which may impose some limitations or restrictions on your wife's ability to enter Canada, even within the validity of that visa. The last thing I want to add to that is, um... Because Canada, Canada entry, entry requirements um, are quite unique. A lot, there are a lot of misinterpretations as to the validity of your visa from outside of Canada, depending on the country you are coming from. So 
So what we usually would advise is just so that you don't get to the airport and you argue with anybody, try as much as possible to ensure that your ticket, uh, the, 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 the travel date on your ticket fall within the duration of the validity of your visa. Because you may get to the airport and you meet an immigration officer who doesn't know the Canadian immigration rules. You have a visa that is supposed to expire on the 30th of April and you have a return date for 5th of May. That immigration officer, the, uh, I mean, or even the, um, an airline officer may end up re refusing you uh, to board the aircraft because they believe that your return date falls outside the validity of your visa. My mom, for instance, her very first visa was for, um, was for six months. And she came in maybe a month before the expiry. So we bought a ticket within that period and then she came in. All you need to do when, 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 when you come in, if there is no annotation, just like Prof has said, if at the point of, um, at the point you meet a CDS official, there is no annotation on your passport. It automatically means that you have six months. If there's an annotation that you must leave on a particular date, you have to leave. But what you can then do is, if you want her to stay beyond the six months, if there is, there is no annotation, you apply for an extension from within, the, from within Canada. And that extension, if you have good reasons, the extension will be granted. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so I can see a response from him saying that's my question. Well addressed. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay so um, I'm just going to quickly move on to the next question now. And that's from Ademola Adams. Can an application for PR be done simultaneously with a study permit application as an alternative, taking into cognizance the halt in the federal skilled workers draw recently? I think that's a question we just addressed. Um two questions ago. Uh, we don't advise that you do that. Um, bottom line, yes, we know that in the, in the last one year, there hasn't been any federal, any, any express entry draw for um, applicants within the federal skilled worker class. Uh, we all understand why that is the case. That is the, the case because of the pandemic, right? There are a lot of travel restrictions for even citizens who are citizens and permanent residents coming into Canada, not to talk of newcomers. So even for people who have obtained um, um, they are TOPR, right? Uh, that's the Convention of Permanent Residence, right? They have restrictions to even come into Canada at this time. And I think the only exception at, at this day is if you have a relative, a, a relative in Canada who can attest to the fact that he's your relative and they can cater for you when you come in. Um, right now, there are a lot of restrictions, which is why uh, there are no draws within the federal state worker class. The, the, the whole goal is to ensure that there are, you don't have so many qualified permanent residents of Canada out there who are being kept from entering into the country. But I think that we just entered into the third wave, the third wave, third wave of this pandemic. Um, so it is likely, I'm not saying that, that, that it is likely that um, we'll only continue to have draws in respect of applicants within the Canadian Experience Plus and the um, provincial um, um, who, and applicants who come in from the uh, from within the provincial nominee programs, the I, I would say that as soon as the pandemic ends, I see the government of Canada concentrating their draws on applicants who are within the um, the federal skilled worker class. Uh, what you would see is that the very first few draws that will be introduced by the government of Canada would have very high cutoff points. You know why that is the case? That, that would be the case because there are a lot of people who are out there who, are, who have their profile ready, who are qualified. So they, it, it is very competitive out there. Uh, what I advise any of you right now who, who is in the profile is to try as much as possible to look at areas of improving on, um, improving on their current scores so that as soon as um, um, these draws are conducted, you fall within the very few that are picked. I think that is outside the topic for today, but again, that's, that's just been thrown out there. Yeah, but anyway, that's a very good point you raised, so. <laughs> Okay, so uh, moving on, next question is from Ade. Um, at what point will my family join me or apply to come to Canada after I get a study permit? 
That's a very subjective uh, question. I, I, nobody can really advise you at what point your families can join, but uh, uh, again, so don't forget that the application for your family to join is also a discussional application. You must be able to substantiate why your family is coming to join. You haven't said that you are traveling alone, you are traveling alone to study. So here at EO Law, what we do is to ensure that the applicant comes in here first, start studies, start your studies first, settle in, not that you will make the application immediately, your application for study permit is granted. I'm just saying, if, with the benefit of hindsight, I would say, come in here, start your studies, ensure that you've settled in, and you are providing good reasons why you want your, your family members to join you. More often than not, if you explain your application very well, they'll join you. In terms of months, weeks, or years, I can't say that, but I would say it, um, it's it's only logical for you to know when exactly you should make that application, which is when you have good enough reasons for you to say, this is why your family members are coming in to join you. Um, th that's a very good point. And if I may also add to that, because um, I mean, as much as possible, you want to be, we want to be forthright or look forthright with the visa officer. Uh -huh. So if you just apply that you're going alone, then you get your visa while you are still in Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia, wherever you are, Immediately after getting your study permit, then the next day you now file another application for your family. Any visa officer looking at that will be kind of skeptical. What exactly is this guy trying to play some game or what? So like uh, Edo rightly said, leave first, come to Canada, start your study. You know, after you've registered, you started your study, you can get a letter from your school confirming that you registered as a student, then send invitation to your family. Maybe probably assuming you start in the um, fall semester, or that you're inviting them for them to join you during school break in the next summer, something like that. So that it will look reasonable to somebody looking at your application. Well, this person is being forthright as opposed to, I got my study permit today, then tomorrow I now throw in another application for my wife and all my children to join me. So don't leave and don't give them any room for doubt. Just try to make sure that uh, the application process looks as forthright as it is. So, the key word there is, if you get the visa, uh, come in, start your study. After you started your study and you relatively settled, then invite your family to join you. And doing that, please try as much as possible to get a letter from your school indicating that you are registered as a student because you are giving this, what you have is a study visa. So they need to be convinced that yes, you're actually studying in Canada. You are registered in a school and studying in Canada. And now you are inviting your family to join you. Thanks, Prof. Um, so move on to the next question, and that question is from Mercy. Um, does Canadian consulate interview applicants for visa like the U.S. consulate? No, like I mentioned earlier, um, most of the applications for study permits are paper-based. Um, rarely would they have, rarely would they invite you for an oral interview. If they have any concerns relating to your application, they will send you what is called a procedural fairness letter. Um, more or less detailing the, the, the concerns that they have and giving you uh, a time frame within which to address those concerns. There are, in terms of other applications, there are instances where you may be invited for oral interview. One of those instances is if, for instance, um, it's an application for spousal sponsorship, right? Um, you have a Canadian permanent resident or citizen who is sponsoring somebody from outside, sponsoring a spouse from outside of Canada. If they believe that an interview is required, they may call you to come into the, um, the high commission or the embassy, depending on the country where um, the Canadian mission is situated for an oral interview. But for study permits, rarely, rarely would they invite you for an oral interview, which is why we, we are saying, ensure that you exercise a lot of patience, ensure that your, your application is well documented, ensure that you have an explanation letter that identifies the criteria relating to your application and that you are addressing each of these items one after the other to give the visa officer a full perspective as to your understanding of the nature of the application and your um, meeting the requirements of that application. And uh, if I may also add to that, um, um, most generally uh, study visa application in Africa are not processed in the country where you apply. For example, study visa application from Nigeria, I think currently they are processed in Kenya before it used to be Ghana. So before 
a visa, before the visa office invites you for interview, there must be serious reason why they are inviting you. In fact, cases where I have seen applicants being invited for oral interview are usually cases where the application has been refused. The applicant mm -hmm. comes to Canada, I mean, hires a lawyer in Canada, challenges, successfully challenges the refusal application, then it's sent to the visa office. Then those are cases where I have seen the applicant being invited to for interview. And in those cases, they may normally have to arrange with somebody at the local I mean, embassy in your country for them to conduct the interview. So it's very, it doesn't really happen. It's very rare for it to happen. All right, thank you. So moving on to the next question from um, Alimu. Is there a minimum time required to stay in Canada to apply for PR? Uh, that, that question is a bit uh, too general. Um, I want to believe that you are asking whether there is a minimum time to apply for permanent residence if you are here on a study permit. So I'm trying to narrow the question, right? If that is the case, if you are here on a study permit, you can only apply for permanent residence, um, uh, permanent residence as a student in Canada, if you meet other classes, other criteria, not necessarily as a student in Canada. It must be based on some other program that has been introduced by the government of Canada. So we've had cases where you have students here in Canada apply for permanent residence. They're based on federal skilled worker class because they meet the requirement of that class. Or if there's a provincial nominee class, or you have a spouse who has qualified and you are applying as a, as a, as a spouse to somebody who has, a, who has qualified. But strictly as a student, for you to apply for permanent residence, you must complete your study. There is a criteria you must meet for postgraduate work permit. You then apply for your postgraduate work, for work permit. It is handed over to you. Within the duration of a postgraduate work permit, you must apply for permanent residence. Again, we can't be discussing that here. There is a criteria for applying for permanent residence under the Canadian Experience Class. You must have completed your studies. You must have your postgraduate work permit. You must have uh, a, a minimum of one year Canadian work experience. You must be applying within the validity of um, your work permit. Otherwise, you will run out of status if you do not have your permanent residence by the time your postgraduate work permit expires. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so thank you. Um, next question: Can you share us the the? Can you share with us the PowerPoint? I think that has been addressed. Um, mm -hmm. Our YouTube link will be shared with with the house. Um, the next question here is from Joseph: um, Is a study loan acceptable as proof of funds when applying for a study permit? I I would draw a negative inference to a study loan <laughs> because. Don't forget that a study loan is different from a scholarship, right? <laughs> if you have a scholarship, that is a huge advantage to your application, right? The, if you are looking at a study loan from who? Your employer? It depends on who that loan is coming from. But generally, if you are taking a loan to come to study in Canada, I, I think most immigration officer, officers would draw a negative in France. To, um, uh, to such a step, right? The, I'm trying to look at very extreme, extreme circumstances. Say for instance, you are giving, I won't call it a loan, if you are giving a grant by an employer to come study and there are conditions tied to that grant. For instance, you are returning back to Niger Nigeria, um, Ghana, Kenya, wherever you are applying from, based on that grant that has been given to you. But generally as a loan, I would think that that is, um, that is not an advantage to your application. Okay, so I'm moving, I'll move on to the next question now. Um, for my day, assuming I get the study permit and my spouse already has a visa, can he still apply for a visa with the children to join me or how do we go about it? If uh, I would, again, this is a general question. I would answer it as best as I can. 
if your spouse already you got your study permit after your wife, your husband obtained a visa or your wife obtained a visa, which to a very large extent means that your wife or your husband has a visa. visa. If that is the case, I wouldn't make any application for work permit for your husband or anyone until you arrive in Canada. Come into Canada, your husband comes in as a visa, make any application, any further immigration application you are making from within Canada. The reason why we are advising that you make the application from within Canada is because if you make the application from within Canada, it is treated here in Canada. If you make that application from outside of Canada, it's treated by the responsible visa office, um, um, uh, uh, um, responsible for your country. For instance, if it is Nigeria, oftentimes you see the applications being treated by either Kenya, London, we have seen Ukraine handling visa applications from Nigeria. And the scrutiny by visa officers for applications made outside of Canada are much more rigorous than applications made from within Canada. So I would say if the family, the entire family has visa to come in, irrespective of the type of visa, let the students come in, come study, let whoever the wife or the husband who has the visa visa also come in, that make the application for the subsequent immigration, I mean, make the subsequent immigration application as soon as, as soon as he or she enters into Canada as a visitor. All right, thank you. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next question. Are we getting this, power, this PowerPoint document at the end? That has been addressed. Um, next question, can you share with us schools to apply to, Prof? Can we share what? Can you share with us the schools to apply to? Well, we can't share that. Uh, we can't share that. Contact ASI. <laughs> contact, I, I contact think, ASI. Uh, well, I, I think that's a very easy one. It, uh, Google can, um, there are a lot of them. All you just need to do is to do an internet search. Um, yeah. We're not in the business of recommending schools in ASI. Um, if you want to study in Canada, I think you have a, a personal obligation to go online uh, search for schools that offer the courses you want to study and then follow up with them with regards to the admission process. Yeah. Uh, if you have to uh, contact an immigration practitioner, there are a lot of immigration practitioners out there who can also assist you with that process. If you don't want to go online, then make, make that contact directly, okay? <laughs> So next question, Olua Femi, what's the difference between the study permit and study visa? Does a refusal in study permit add to your visa refusal pro profile? I honestly don't understand that question, but um, if you have a permit to come in to study in Canada, that is different from your re-entry visa. So in addition to your study permit, you must have a re-entry visa to go in and come out of the country uh, that you are, you are applying from. So if you have, usually what happens is that when you submit your study permit application, for those who are applying from Nigeria, Ghana, and I believe Kenya, you don't apply with your passport. It's that oftentimes, even if it's a paper-based application or an online application, you are not required to submit your passport. Your passport is only um, your passport is only um, um, uh, requested for after the application has been approved. So what you would see when the passport comes back is your re-entry visa on that passport. It's quite different from your study permit, right? So these are two documents that go hand in hand, and I hope that addresses your question. There are a lot of students who are here who have. Um, um, study permits that are valid for three years, right? But have re-entry visas valid for lesser duration because of the validity of their passport. So what usually would happen is that even though you have a valid study permit here in Canada, for you to leave Canada and be able to return back to Canada successfully, you must apply for a re-entry visa that would necessarily take you out of Canada and bring you back to Canada. Thank you very much. If, if I may. If I may quickly add to that. So when you apply for study permit, and now we're looking at based on the presumption that um, 
the person asking this question has, and of course, most of the participants here are outside Canada. So when you apply for study permits, or yeah, you file an application for study uh -huh. permit. If it is successful, you are not issued a study permit. You are issued a study visa. So they will ask for your passport and stamp the visa on your passport. You don't have a study permit yet. That visa is like a visiting visa, but for students, which enables you to board a plane, fly to Canada. At the port of entry, you now give your, the visa officer your passport and the visa officer sees that you have a student visa and your student visa will come with another letter telling you that your study permit has been approved. So that letter is what you give to the visa officer now, indicating that your study permit has been approved. And this is a visa I'm using to fly to Canada. So what this visa officer will do is now issue your study permit at the port of entry. Port of entry. Yeah. yeah. So having a student study visa is not a study permit and it's not a guarantee of a study permit. You can come into Canada with your study, study visa and the visa officer may be on second third or examination final that may be probably lied during the process of the application, or you don't have the qualification, or your intention is not to come to Canada to study, they can refuse you a study permit even at that point. So that's the that's basic cool. difference between the two. Study visa allows you to board a plane, fly to Canada as a student, and then the study permit is what you are issued when the visa officer, um, uh, you meet to the visa officer at the port of entry. Sorry, the, not the visa officer, the um, CBSA officer. CBSA officer, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, there were a couple of, uh, just last year, there were a couple of students from Asia, one of the popular countries in Asia, who landed in Toronto, right, as students. And they were turned back right from the airport. Not even as students, as even as permanent residents, they were turned back because they realized that uh, most of them were carrying um, um, IESES results that were falsified. I don't know how they went about it, but they raised very serious allegation and they turned them back up, back from Canada. All right, thank you. So then, so this is not a question, but this is from Ademola Adams. And Ademola says, powerful and insightful presentation from my mentor and astute immigration lawyer, <laughs> Edos Omar. Edos, that seems to be one of your many fans. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so uh, I'll just move on to the next question again. Um, Joseph, I'm at the verge of submitting my application. I'm a BSc holder with an upper second class honors. However, I am opting for a postgraduate certificate at the uh, Conestoga College. This is because the course models fascinate me a lot. Um, there has been a lot of rumors that a 2 1 graduate applying for a PG program would most likely be refused. Please, can you? Can can you kindly clarify this myth? I think we've discussed progression exhaustively. Um, I understand that the program fascinates you, but <laughs> you must ensure that it also fascinates the immigration officer who is reviewing your application. Because if you are not able to explain your progression, it would be a very tall order for that application to be granted. Don't, we talked about the general aura of your application. Don't don't uh, don't give the impression that you are desperate. If you give the impression that you are desperate to come to Canada, it gives the immigration officer an impression that you are not a serious student or that you have ulterior motives, right? So um, if you have if you are a two one graduate and you are looking at coming to study what course uh, with Conestoga College, I may have an issue with that personally. As I mean, you retain my friend to represent you, I would have an issue with that, right? I will generally look at regular universities who offer similar programs that fascinate you, ensure that there is a progression. The, the word progression carries a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of um, um, intent, so to speak. If you are looking at progression, you are looking at when you graduated, what you've been doing since you graduated up until you made this application, if, you, if you've been working, the nature of work that you've been doing, what your responsibilities are, what course you are coming to study in Canada, how does that course impact on what you studied, you studied in whatever country you're applying from and the job you've been doing. Tie all that in, make sure it makes a lot of sense, right? 
we've got a graduate who a, a graduate a, a client who um, who made an application to a school in Nova Scotia about a year plus ago, right? She studied, she had BS in nursing in Nigeria, but getting any program, any admission for nursing in Canada is very, very strenuous right now. It's very difficult for you to obtain one because with the pandemic and all that, a lot of people now realize that the health sector is very, very attractive. So what we did in that instance was to look at a cost, not necessarily nothing, that ties to what she, she was doing in Nigeria and, and, and then to a very large extent explain the progression to show that this cost would impact on what she's doing. She intends to return back to Nigeria and this is what she intends to do in line with the cost that she's taking up. Do not forget, Prof mentioned earlier today that up to 80%, if not more than, right, of study permit applications are refused. Of the 20% we are talking about, a greater majority of those 20% are people who are coming for undergraduate studies. Students who just completed SSC or who are in SS2 on the basis of their transcript, you're able to have, obtain admission. At that age, the requirements you are expected to meet are lesser than graduate students. So you are a graduate student, you must ensure that you fall within this minority. And the only way you can do that is to explain your progression very well. Conestoga College, for me, may not cut it. Thank you. And uh, if I may also add to that, I think, um, like I said, if you're applying for Canada study permit, please take your best shot. At this point, I'm unfortunately to say this, what uh, fascinates you is irrelevant. What is relevant is what is going to fascinate the person reviewing your application. And take note, if you get the study permit application and enter Canada, the process of changing from one school to another is very easy. It's just a matter of going online and notify citizenship and immigration that, look, I'm changing from University of Toronto to Conestoga College. College. It's yeah. just as easy as that. So instead of going to pursue a doomed application of applying to Conestoga College, look for a university where you can show career progression. If you come in here and then you want to go to college, fine. What matters is that you have the intention and you are going to school when you come in here with a study visa. As long as you don't just come in there, throw away your passport and go start working under the table, that's where you're gonna have a problem. But if you apply to a university, get a visa to study in a university and then come in here and say, no, I don't wanna to go to university anymore. I want to go to college. And you're actually going to college. Nobody is going to have any issue with you for doing that. And the process is very easy. The process is just a matter of getting admission in that college and then going online to notify citizenship and immigration that I'm changing from this university to this college. So for now, put the fascination aside, please uh, prepare a solid application that has the best chance of success. Um, so the next question here is Kelechi. Please give an email to reach you guys. Thank you and phone number. Um, Kelechi, if you scroll down in the chat, you would see that I posted the contact information on how to reach um, the members of the EO law firm. Um, okay. And I'll probably uh, post our Twitter and uh, YouTube channels where you can also uh, um, link with us and follow up with us on subsequent webinars if that will help. I'll be posting that on the chat box immediately. And there's also already the chat for EO Law Firm and the contacts already on the chat box. Um, Oziolas, thanks for this platform. I wish to study in Canada. I'm a medical lab laboratory scientist. Is there going to be either a WhatsApp group chat or how can we get in touch with you guys for one-on-one -on -one chat to put me through the process? Um, I, there is no group chat, but the contact information is, is in the chat box. Um, Okay. Well, um, well it, it, we don't have the resources to provide one-on-one -on -one chat for now. We don't have any WhatsApp group. Our primary means of communication or disseminating information for now is our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube channel, as well as webinars like this. Um, as time um, goes on, when we're able to have the resources to uh, hire more hands to assist, then we'll probably be able to expand. But for now, uh, the best we can offer is, of course, uh, webinars like this, as well as uh, other interactive features using social media. 
Um, next question is from Ademola Adams. Is there a time frame to lodge an application for leave and judicial review after refusal of one's application? Yeah, I think I, I discussed that earlier today. Um, I did mention that um, if it's an out of country application, as I assume that most of us here today will be making, um, it's going to be 50 days from the date the application was refused. So you must lodge your application for leave and for judicial review at the Federal Court of Canada within those 50 days. If you are outside of those 50 days, you can apply for extension of time within which to file your application for leave and judicial review if you have cogent reasons why you were out of time. So it's safer for you to make that application as, uh, as soon as you make up your mind to do so within the 60 day period required, I mean, allowed by the federal court rules. All right, on to the next question. Where can we access the recordings of this webinar? Um, Prof will share the YouTube link where you can have access to this webinar. Um, we'll be sending an uh, automated, uh, we'll be sending an um, if message to all registered participants uh, using Eventbrite messaging. We'll also be posting the link on our um, Twitter channel. Sorry, on our Twitter um, yeah, page, so. All right, so this is a question from Dotu. Dotu says, I am 30 years old and I'm preparing to apply for a study permit to pursue a master's degree in Canada. I am single, but I have a fiance in Nigeria. Does my age impact on my chances of getting a study permit? Is my fiance, who I am in a common law partnership relationship with, strengthen my home ties? I stated in my letter of explanation that I will return to get married. I do not generally see the fact that you are, uh, that you are in a relationship being a positive factor to your application for study permit. Again, do not forget that these immigration officers would rigorous, rigorously review your application for study permit. And we all know that under the express entry policy, once you turn 30, you start having, you start having negative points in terms of your attribute for age. So the best time to apply for permanent residence would be prior to when you turn 30. So the fact that you are applying for study permit at 30 throws up a whole lot of issues that a visa officer will consider. So this is also where your progression would matter. Um, here in Canada, we, uh, the, the, we, we recognize common law relationships. Common law relationships are relationships between um, two people who are basically living together as husband and wife but not married. Right? Um, the, it, don't forget that your application is being treated from outside of Canada. Even though these visa officers are required to apply the rules as if um, that they were in Canada, or as if um, 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 they are recognizing you as common law partners, at the end of the day, it is a discretionary application. You may have to see a visa officer who will say, hey, I don't really believe that this relationship exists. For you to prove a common law relationship, the only way, again, if you want to rely on your, your, your partner, your girlfriend or your boyfriend, as um, a form of um, tie to the country you're applying from, is for you to be able to substantiate that he or she falls into the category of people that you can actually describe as common law partners. But I would say that this, to a very large extent does not help your application for study permit. Um, I think that um, not so much weight will be granted to such um, a claim. I'm not saying it's impossible again, but I'm saying from my experience, not so much weight will be granted to such a claim. You have to look generally at your age and every other factor. Look at the progression of your application in terms of when you completed studies, what you've been doing since you completed studies, what you are coming to Canada to do. Look at all the other reasons that we have discussed this morning and ensure that you are addressing those reasons to be able to have a complete application in place. Uh, thank you. Um, if there are no further comments on that, I'll just move on to the next question um, from Fatima. As a follow-up on the question of family, 
should a spouse apply for a visit visa, a visiting visa, or an open work permit? So are, are you saying for a spouse who, are, who is outside of Canada applying to visit a study permit holder in Canada who is a husband or a wife? That perhaps is what this person is, ask, is asking. Do you, do you think it's, because that, that question is a bit- Sorry, um, can you ask the question again, Mariam? Um, as a follow-up on the question of family, should a spouse apply for a visit visa or an open work permit? Well, without a visit visa, you can't even get into Canada in the first place. So I think the <laughs> most- So Prof, sorry, I think what this question is, if you're, if you're a spouse and then you're, if your spouse is in Canada on a, on a study permit as an, yeah. as an international student, can mm. your spouse in Nigeria apply for a, should the spouse in Nigeria apply for a visiting visa or an open work permit that we base so, on that study permit? So what I'm saying, without a visiting visa, you can't even get into Canada. So if you apply for an open work permit, you also need to apply for a visiting visa. No, no, the prof, I think, uh, yeah, there's a distinction here that you can apply for a visiting visa without applying for an open work permit. So I okay. think what this person wants to know is whether you should apply for the visa in addition to the open work permit or just okay. apply for the visa, visa and come in here. First. Okay, okay. If you already have your husband or your wife here studying and you are just applying, and we see this happen a lot, you're just applying for a visiting visa, chances are that the visitor visa will be refused, right? If you're just saying, I am visiting, returning back to, uh, returning back to wherever you're applying from, those criteria, a lot of criteria will be put in place right including your ties to your country and i think that's the major factor that will work against you i would rather advise that you look at the possibility of applying for an open work permit explain it which is why we said we advise that whoever is a student should travel first settle in properly continue with our studies get a letter in the course of our studies saying this, this person is currently a student, is not out of school, and make that application for your visa and your open work permit at the same time. A visa officer would generally conclude that you are using the visa visa as a means to, to come into Canada and then stay back without applying for um, whatever you need to apply for. It's different from when you already have the visa visa, right? One or two questions ago, I said, if you already have a visa visa, I would rather suggest you travel and come into Canada before making the application for the open work permit. The only reason why that is being done is because when you travel into Canada with your visa visa, nobody will turn you back. I'm coming to see my family members, but don't forget that you made that application for visa visa based on other reasons before the study permit was granted. My wife or my husband has obtained the uh, uh, study permit uh, subsequently, and I'm, I'm coming here to come visit him or her, right? When you come in, you can make the application for an open work permit. But if you do not have a visa visa from the country you're applying from, it is better that you apply for both, uh, both um, uh, you make both applications at the same time. Um, okay, so on to the next question. Um, can someone with an MSc apply for a postgraduate study again in Canada? Uh, well, you see this happen a lot. Um, again, it is difficult to explain progression in that instance, um, but you see a lot of people who already have master's, master's degree coming to apply for a second master's degree and all that. Your progression will matter how you explain it, depending on the nature of the course, depending on what you're doing would matter a lot. But it reduces your chances um, as against if you are applying for a uh, master's without having previously obtained one. All right, so um, um, the next question from Boma, what's your YouTube handle? Um, that will be shared with um, everyone after the webinar. I've actually, um, um, I've actually posted that below the, at the chat, so she should look further down. All right, so Boma, if you're, if you're here, you should just uh, scroll to the end of the chat and you'll find the link. Um, the next question is from Joseph. Um, can a pension account statement help strengthen home ties? 
school's pension account statement, the student's pension account statement, which suggests that that student is applying after at a very, at a very, I don't know, whose pension account statement? Is it the parent's pension account statement? Is it the student's pension account statement? Because a whole lot of factors will, will, will come in depending on who is, whose pension statement is being relied upon. Okay. Let's move to the next question. Maybe the person can clarify. Maybe. All right. Is it, is it true that an applicant with high number with a high number of dependents can be refused a visa, a study permit? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> a lot of applicants can be refused can be refused a study permit. It depends on it depends on who is applying. Um, if you have a number of if you have a lot of dependents, right? That are, that can act as an advantage. It can act as a disadvantage. It can act as an advantage in the sense that you are the one applying, none of your family members are traveling with you and all that. It can act as a disadvantage if you have very limited resources in support of your application and you are saying you are coming to Canada to study. Um, and you know studies in Canada is, is a very expensive venture. So if you start to start looking at your family size, looking at what you've submitted in support of your application, will come to the conclusion that, hey, given the number of family members this person has, right, I do not see um, he's embarking on a study permit based on the financials that he or she has committed to be reasonable in the circumstance. And don't forget that this is a discretionary application. Okay. Um, so next question from Thank God. Um, Thank God's question is, can someone be working to raise funds while studying in Canada? There are rules regarding um, work in Canada while you are studying. Um, if it is during school, um, if, it, if, it, if school is in session, you have, I think, a maximum of 20 hours per week, right? But if it is off session, you're on holiday, um, school is not going on, you can work for unlimited hours. So you must ensure that you keep to these, the provisions of this rule, because at the end of the day, if you breach any of these provisions, for instance, you are working on limited hours during school, uh, during, um, um, while school is in session, that may work against you when you are making subsequent applications for any immigration facility. All right, so next question is from Stanley. Can I ask a question directly without having to type it here? Um, uh, I think we'll probably, we will deal with the questions that have been typed already. And um, if there is time, which I'm afraid we may not have much time because we're already running out of time. So if you can type your question, that would be appreciated. That saves time to respond. Um, so quickly on to the next question, Galaxy A74. Hello everyone, great presentation so far. Please, what is the best way to prove family ties? Can I use an affidavit written by my mom on my late father's property, even if there is no direct document willing the property to her? There are a lot of ways of proving family ties. If, for instance, you have a birth certificate in support of your application, don't forget that your parents' names would have been stated in your birth certificate. Uh, all birth certificates in Nigeria, whether obtained through the National Population Commission or directly from the hospital, would usually state your parents' name. Don't also forget that in, 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 in submitting your application for study permit, you are required to complete a family information form. The family information form will require you to state the names of your parents, right? So um, once you can tie all that in to show that your parents are in Nigeria, you would have been able to um, establish that you have ties to, I mean, you would have been able to um, explain your relationship to your parents not necessarily satisfying the visa officer that you have strong ties to uh, whatever country you're applying from. Okay. Um, next question. Does age limit matter for study, for study permit applications? Yes, age limits matter, which is why we, when, we, when we said more than 80% of study permit applications are, are, being, are being refused, you'll find out that a larger number of the 20% or less that have been approved fall within the younger applicants who are just completing their uh, first level, their high school education in Nigeria, that is the SSC. The only reason why that is the case is because, because they are younger, 
the requirements you have to fulfill in terms of progression and all that is is lesser right <laughs> is lesser in addition to that you also find out that uh more often than not such categories of of applicants are sponsored by their parents who submit all the all the financial all the financial uh, documents required to to grant such an application. So age does matter. With 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 an older um, an older age, you find out that the requirements that you have to fulfill to have your study permit application granted will be much more extensive. Thank you. Okay. Um. It seems we are running out of time, and uh, so I think at this point, I think we we'll uh, focus on uh, strictly on questions that has to do with uh, study permit application, of course, which is the essence of this uh, webinar, because we may not really have time. There's a lot of question on the chat box, we may not have time to respond to all of them. So let's focus uh, maybe for the next 15 minutes, let's focus on um, the questions on uh, study permit so that we can be able to round off. Okay. So I'm going to skip questions on PRs, questions on visitor visas and uh, just run through the questions and study permits. Um, so I see one, okay, while you're looking, Mar um, Mariam, I see one question on, from Galaxy Tab A, to study in Canada for master's program, uh, is it uh, must to have IELTS exam? The answer is no. Most schools in Canada exempt English language testing exam for, for applicant from English, from countries where English is the primary language of instruction in their educational system. So this question is kind of vague. If you apply from countries, especially in Africa, where English is the primary language of instruction, you may be exempted from the IELTS exam. If you're applying to study a program in English and you're probably applying from country where French or other language or Arabic is the primary language of instruction, they may require this. So you need to contact the school you're applying to to find out if IELTS exam is required for the program you're applying. But in most cases, generally it's exempted. Yeah, let me, let me just quickly chip in there because um, there is also a policy that has been introduced by the High Commission in Nigeria. It's called the Nigerian Student Express. Yeah. Um, um, you know, ordinarily to address to assess applications for study permit from the West African region, if you want to go through the regular route, it will take you a minimum of two months. With the Nigerian Student Express, it's just a policy carved out for uh, strictly Nigerian applicants, right? The, the IRCC is trying to streamline the period for, such, uh, for the assessment of such application to 20 days or less, right? Under that policy, um, I know it's debatable. I think Prof. <laughs> Prof has his view regarding some of the requirements that have been introduced as a result of the Nigerian Student Express. But one of those policies is that you must obtain um, an, IA, an IELTS result, right? In this case, it's IELTS academic, not general training. And you must obtain um, uh, a minimum of six points in each of the four um, uh, components. That's reading, speaking, writing, and, and listening. So, but the point here is, if and sorry, and from our experience, based on the last set of study study visa applications that we submitted on behalf of our clients, we now realize that even if even when you don't apply under the Nigerian Student Express, some visa officers are now asking you to um, submit my bank statement. Um, IELTS just so as to convert your application from the, I mean, move your application from the regular stream to the Nigerian uh, Student Express stream so as to uh, assess that application in a, in, a, in a faster manner. So what I would generally recommend until that policy changes is that when you are making your application for study permit at this stage, just have it at the back of your mind that you may be required to sit for the IELTS. I would always encourage you so that you don't wait until um, the immigration officer requests that you provide an IELTS result. I would recommend that you try as much as possible to sit for the IELTS for IELTS academic and obtain the minimum scores um, prior to when you are requested to do that, if they ever do that. If they don't and you have the right course, attach the IELTS result as part of your requirements, obtain your my, my bank statement, 
add it to your application so that the visa officer who sees that all these are in place will generally come to the conclusion that, hey, I think this person should be under the Nigerian Student Express and push for that application to be assessed under that, under that route. Uh, thanks, Edos. Well, you brought me into this, so let me um, <laughs> <laughs> let me come in here. Uh, I mean, my position has been very clear. If you have been instructed in your undergraduate studies in English, and a Canadian university goes through your transcripts and admits you to study in Canada without telling you to go write IELTS exam, a visa officer should not be telling you to go write the exam so that they can process your study permit because study permit process has nothing to do, they are not in the best position to assess your English language. The university is in the best position to do that. And if the, English, the university feels that your English language is sufficient for you to undertake graduate studies in the university, a visa officer should not make you incur additional costs in writing a language testing exam for them to process your visa application. So, okay. Then until we'll that, uh, until that yeah, is done. I mean, well, the position now <laughs> is that you have to write it. And I believe that is the position we must all comply with it. Um, but um, I, I don't think that is the right position. And I've been very critical and I made my position very clear on that. Nigerian, I mean, Af applicants from Africa already incur huge amounts of money preparing for their education. I think imposing additional obligation for them to go and write an English language exam they don't even need for the post of their education. That's an unnecessary burden anybody should be imposing on them. So um, the policy is there as it is, and uh, we're hoping at least those who put that policy in place will have a second thought to see that that is usually, that is in, in fact um, a waste of resources for those students, and there's no essence or no need for that policy. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, so I'm going to the next question. Um, hi, my name is Abeniza, and I have just finished college here in Ethiopia. I'm 20 years old, and I wish to study my bachelor's degree in Canada. Can you please describe what are the requirements for a bachelor's degree and how to apply, and how long will the process take to start now, and how to get a work permit and stud student visa? And is it better to apply from Canada or Ethiopia? That's a loaded question. Well, let me just quickly answer your question. You are about the right age to apply for undergraduate studies in Canada. Go on Google, uh, type in applications for study permit to Canada. There are a lot of universities, conduct your assessment. If you want to retain a specialist, an immigration law firm, an immigration consultant who knows what he or she is doing, contact them directly and they will provide you with those services. Um, there is no option for you to apply for study permit from within Canada if you are in Ethiopia. You can only apply for study permit from Ethiopia, but that application will be, uh, will be sent to the embassy generally responsible for countries around Ethiopia, including Ethiopia. So um, yes, you can apply for study permit at the age of 20. You're just finishing your high school, which is a good time for you to make your application. You're about the right age to make the application. Um, in terms of the, the, the steps that you have to follow, that you can always get online. If you need to retain a professional, contact us, contact other immigration course consultants out there who can, who can possibly um, assist you with your application. But I would tell you categorically, there is no way you, uh, your application can be accessed from within Canada. If you retain a firm like ours, and we submit your application under our representative product, we have our representative product for all our clients, the fact that we submitted that application from within Canada does not necessarily mean that that application will be treated from Canada. It will also be, it will, it will still be sent to the responsible visa office um, to, to, to have the visa officer attend to that application. I hope that answers your question. Yes, I believe that does. So um, we are really running far uh, out of time. So, um, so um, we have also have uh, from EO Law Firm here, we also have um, Emmanuel. So, Emmanuel will probably want to chip in one or two things before we leave. Emmanuel, are you there? Can you unmute? If I may just say something briefly, Emmanuel is more or less the backbone of uh, immigra the immigration practice at EO Law. He is an immigration consultant. By being an immigration consultant, I mean that he trained by the a body um, responsible for immigration consultants in Canada. He's qualified to practice as an immigration consultant and he works out of um, EO Law. Hi, good afternoon. Um, nice to meet everyone. I, 
I think most of the issues that need to be addressed with regards to solid permits and refusals have been addressed. But I just want to chip in. I mean, as a practice and from experience, what we have seen is, like Professor said, the high level of refusals from that part of the world, Africa precisely, right? Um, so a way that I would typically advise people to handle their certain permit, permit applications is from a defensive position, right? There are certain criteria that you need to meet. Some are within your control, others are not within your control. So the onus is on you to very large extent to try to address all issues that are within your control so that you know that at least those issues have been knocked off the table. Issues relating to proof of funds, issues relating to um, um, several issues that I don't seem to just come to me. There are several issues that you can automatically nail up and know that, I mean, like travel history, like the professor said, right? You can nail up and close out on those histories so that the visa officer would not have an opportunity to, I mean, hold on to that. There's been cases where, I mean, some visa officers will still hold on to such reasons for refusing application, even after they have been addressed. But as long as it has been addressed, it makes it easier for you to eventually defend or um, defend more like when it comes to an application for labor and judiciary when you apply down the line. So, I mean, like um, Edo said, you need a lot of planning, you need a lot of patience. This might be something that might take you months and in some cases years, but I mean, if your application is put in first, and like Professor said, you have to get it right the first time, right? Um, if it's something that you, you put in a very strong application the first time, chances are that you get it and then yeah, hopefully everything works out well. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel, for those points. And that's very, I mean, uh, that's a very good point to make, you know, handling this matter from a defensive position. And this is what I keep telling, I mean, even among my uh, lawyer colleagues, yeah, I keep telling them that when you're applying for study permit application, especially for applicants coming from Africa, you apply in anticipation of litigation. Correct. That is you apply bearing in mind that this application will be refused and will go to federal court. So you apply in such a way that you have prepared for arguments you will make when this case eventually end up in court. Because if you have 80% refusal rate, then what does that mean? That means out of every 10 application, only two are successful. The other eight are not, I mean, there are cases where there may be justified reason for refusal, but the other eight are not really refused because they, are, they didn't meet the criteria. So um, studying, I mean, in Canada, it's a wonderful opportunity, but getting to the biggest obstacle you have is that visa application process. And it's not getting easier, it's getting more difficult. And of course, that's the reason why we have not just one, but two seminars on this. And um, it is my hope and belief that the information provided in this seminar so far, you have found it useful and um, you will probably put them into use when you uh, apply for your study permit. Canada is a wonderful place to study. And um, your decision to study in Canada, uh, it's in fact a very good decision to make. And um, we thank you all for those of you who are joining us from different parts of the world. So we have the contact information or social media contacts for uh, EO Law Firm. Uh, please follow them on Twitter and um, their social media handle. You also have the uh, Twitter or social media handle for uh, African Scholars Initiative, where we post regular updates on our webinars, as well as other information relating to funding, scholarship, and uh, study in Canada. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I know many of you in some parts of the world are staying late to uh, watch this. At the end of this webinar, we're gonna be sending out um, uh, um, email to all registered participants with the video link. So for those of you who are unable to join or who joined late at the cost in, I mean, uh, midway into the presentation, you will have opportunity to view the uh, web, I mean, the webinar. And uh, please follow up, I mean, follow us on YouTube to also uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel to get updates on our, our webinar. We are still going to be hosting more webinars in time and we'll keep you informed once new ones are planned. And um, for EDOS and EO law firms, uh, it's members of the EO law firm, we thank you very much for your supporting uh, planning for this webinar as, as well as also your time in joining to make this presentation. We really appreciate it and we'll always uh, come back to you and when we have uh, more 
webinars on uh, study permit application process. So uh, that is it from my end here. Once again, thank you so much for joining the AISI Canada Graduate Study Webinar number six. Goodbye and uh, see you soon.